So, I know it's the end of a long day, so thank you to all of you who are still here. This is a bit like at the end of a Wayankulit show, which you know, tend to last uh, all night, so, so only the, you know, uh, die-hard aficionados are there at the very end, and, you know, things tend to get a bit uh, uh, faster at some point towards the end. I'll, 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 again, keep this relatively short so we can have a bit more of a discussion, and I'm really uh, looking forward to talking more to, to, to the other speakers in this panel. I think that we saw uh, these uh, like really fascinating provocations from uh, Professor Gulam and also from uh, Dr. Dina about uh, different ideas of what theater in Asia might mean. And uh, I hope to contribute a little bit to that discussion as well uh, with this talk on digital tools for the study of tradition. Um, so the focus on this is going to be more on how we can use different kinds of digital technology to study uh, tradition. I'm going to focus specifically on uh, Java because that's the, the part that I know. And what you can see here in this image, this is an image of uh, Wayang Hip Hop. This uh, was recorded here exactly, almost exactly one year ago when we had uh, the Wayang Hip Hop performers uh, come to, to Singapore for the uh, official launching of the Contemporary Wayang Archive. And uh, so this was also a collaboration between the Wayang Hip Hop musicians from Yogyakarta and also the, the Gamelan uh, Singong Laras, which is led by Pa Jan, who's over here as well. And uh, what you see here in this image, I'm just going to talk about it very briefly, is uh, you see uh, uh, Math Benye, uh, Chatur Kunchoro, who's the, the, the puppeteer here, that you can see him wearing uh, glasses, uh, 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 wearing shades. Wait, let me, I cannot decide what to do with this microphone. So um, you see uh, uh, a combination of the tradition here and uh, new ideas. So I guess in some ways this is comparable to the Star Wars performance that uh, Professor Wolan was showing us, that we see somebody who's deeply knowledgeable about the tradition reinventing things in a way that is perhaps controversial, that perhaps not everyone knows, uh, not everybody likes. But here we, we can see like these three, three images are new versions of the of the Punokawan, the, the, the clowns in uh, Japanese Wayan Kulit. So uh, usually, you know, there'd be like, you know, Petruk, uh, Pakong, uh, Garen, uh, but in this case, these are the, uh, Chatur wants to say that these, these are the sons of the Punokawan. So Petruk, which is like, you know, it, it, like the one in blue at, at your far right, you know, Petruk has like a very distinct uh, facial feature. This is a bit a reinterpretation of that, and Chatur says that this is like a Petrik. Yeah, uh, uh, like Patrick, because it's going to like uh, uh, Petruk, and then uh, Pagong becomes uh, Boki, which is the one in blue, and Gareng uh, becomes uh, Gary. So it's like this uh, imagined way in which the new generation of Punokawan are uh, are used. So the Punokawan are of course the uh, the clowns. They're also the clown servants that provide a comic interlude in the Wayang shows. In this case, he's kind of like extending that into a longer piece. And I might show you a bit of a fragment from that performance as well. But this is just to really open this uh, discussion about what these digital tools might be. And I want to give you three examples today in which I think that digital tools can be used. So this is going to be more of a, of a demonstration rather than a, than a fully organized paper. And what I want to suggest is that there are at least three ways in which we can use digital tools. One of them is documentation. The second one is analysis. And the, second, the third one is something that I don't really have a name for, but I'll provisionally call a training of perception. How it can help us to look differently at things that we're not familiar with. How it helps students or those of us who are coming from um, other cultural regions to know what to look for and to start to learn uh, uh, how to uh, enjoy uh, traditional performances. So the first one is documentation. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this project that I mentioned a moment ago called the Contemporary Wayang Archive. This has been funded by the uh, Singapore Ministry of Education, but it was established in collaboration with IFAA, the Indonesian Visual Arts Archive, and with collaboration with uh, uh, the, the, the several Dalang in, 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 in Java, and uh, researchers at uh, Gap Yamada University as well. So documentation, of course, has been going around for an extremely long time. In, in some ways, the history of the form is the history of its documentation. I mean, we, we know that, uh, uh, you know, as uh, Professor Gulam was saying, there are many things that we do not know about Wayang, but the few things that we know about its, uh, its origins and its uh, evolution through Java 
are linked to the documentation that we have. There are these particular uh, copper plate uh, in, uh, inscriptions uh, from the 9th century, the earliest ones, things uh, carved in stone, things uh, recorded in different kinds of, of, of media and material throughout, uh, throughout time. Uh, what I'd like to uh, propose is that digital documentation extends this history of documenting. It has three specific uh, affordances, three specific things that you can do digitally that are slightly uh, harder to do when you have other kinds of media. One is that it's easy to share. This particular archive is freely available. And uh, I think this is really important when it comes to video, as uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Gina was telling me yesterday, how also, you know, sometimes when you are uh, in a place like the Philippines or Mexico where I'm from, I would also learn about Asian traditions by reading about them. And sometimes maybe somebody had some video uh, that was done, you know, at, like uh, maybe like, you know, uh, 10 years ago of one thing that might not necessarily be representative. So the economy of DVDs also means that only certain people with access to certain collections are able to see these performances. Whereas if we put things online, as you know, this video will be online as well, uh, it enables more people to see things. So I think that that's an important thing. It also means that you can ask more, uh, add more languages. Uh, this is a bilingual project that I'll show you in a moment. Uh, at the moment it's in Indonesian and English. Um, the second thing is that it's easy to annotate. So um, annotation uh, has been developed quite extensively for textual materials. Uh, the, many of us have learned also about traditional performances by reading these uh, textual translations. And of course, you know, in forms like uh, uh, Wayan Kulit, where uh, language is, is quite important, you can get a lot of things from a textual uh, annotation, from a, 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 a philological uh, a, a textual companion. But that's only one part of the performance. There are a lot of improvisational, uh, a lot of uh, musical aspects, many different things, that video is still not an ideal tool, but it's a bit better than text. It captures a bit more of this. So what we're interested in doing is combining these intellectual, scholarly traditions of annotating things. I mean, I've, I've always loved annotated editions of things when you have like these uh, richly uh, 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 nuanced uh, commentaries on, on the usage of words, on things that are unique, things that continue a, tradi a particular uh, tradition and things that break with that. So that's one thing that we want to emulate in this digital platform. And the, the third part which is connected is that these uh, explanations are also interactive. So that means we can, uh, you, you can uh, play with this online in the sense that you can hide or show things depending on your level of familiarity with a form. It also enables you to, to go back and forth between the annotation and the video. And we're still doing it in a very simple way at the moment, but we're exploring other ways of, of trying this. So, so, so let me just show you something from the Wayang archive. Uh, some people have seen this before. And uh, so I'm going to try to show some examples that I don't always show. But basically, here we have a, 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 you know, some basic explanation of Wayang. We have some uh, tags that we've added uh, you know, of things that people might be interested in looking for Wayang. Uh, for example, like of course, the traditional language of Wayang is Japanese, and there were all these questions about what happens to a performance when you change the language. Can it still be called uh, 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 Kyoken? Can it still be called Wayang? So, uh, so for example, we have like here uh, performances that are still in Japanese. We have some performances in Indonesian. We even have one that uses French uh, to a certain extent, and you can you know search by by the length, by type of music. So you know things that still use like the traditional um, eating and the uh, gamelan music, things that use other things such as hip hop. You can see there are about three here, and uh, I mean we have like some uh, background as well. If you go to the recordings, which is what I'm going to show you now, you get some basic information about when this was recorded, some contextual uh, historical notes, and then I'm going to show you something from Wayang Republic. So. So this is a performance uh, also by uh, Chatur Kunchoro, but this is uh, not a hip hop performance. And uh, this is, uh, you can log in uh, you can do by Facebook or, or, or create your own free account. But uh, actually I'm, uh, I'm happy to announce that we, now we're going to remove this login mechanism, so now people only need to agree to terms of conditions. Because sometimes there are many people who are put off a little bit by the, uh, by the need to register. So I don't know if I need to do anything about the volume, and I hope people can. Oh yeah, there it goes. 
Okay, so I'm going to show a very short fragment and then explain something about this. <clears throat> Oh, okay, sorry. Um, before I explain, uh, so I'll show you some, just one thing about this uh, cayon. So of course you have at least three cayon here. So, so uh, these are quite contemporary, these ones, like in the, like the actual shape of them represent fire. So sometimes you have a like, certain cayon uh, that is, uh, like, for those of you familiar with Moyang, this is a, a puppet that has several functions. It's always at the beginning of a performance. It also indicates trans transitions between uh, the different scenes, between the different uh, patets of, uh, of, uh, of a performance. And uh, you know, sometimes they have like, certain uh, symbols on one side, and often fire in the other. And this central cayon that you see over here, uh, 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 if you look at the traditional one, it has a, 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 usually like a tree in the center, and it has like, also like some sort of a, a, a palace in the center. In this case, this story is about the city of Jogjakarta, so this is all based on the iconography of the city. At the very top here, you can see the volcano. I don't know if you can really make it out here. This is the Tugu, like in the north of Georgia, the Kraton here. And it, uh, at, at the very bottom, I don't know, uh, it cannot, it's hidden now from sight, but you can see the, the ocean, and you will see it as it moves. So I mean, like, the, the shape itself of the, of the Cayon is uh, a bit similar to the shape of the special region of Jogjakarta. And also, uh, a lot of like, the, the, the mythology of the city is that it's the, 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 the volcano, and the ocean are at these two extremes, and the Graton, the Sultan's Palace, is kind of equidistant from both of these forces. So, in some ways, it's like you know, this is uh, uh, like also like a, a playful reinterpretation of those uh, symbols that you would expect to be slightly different in this cajon. So, yeah, so now I, I shut up and let you watch a little bit. <laughs> So this particular performance that I'm just not going to go into a lot of detail uh, tells the story of the Mimbun uh, Karno, uh, 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 of course, being a Sukarno and the, the, the struggle for independence. And uh, it specifically highlights the role that the city of Jogjakarta had in the struggle for independence. And uh, there are many things that are uh, that we could say are contemporary of this performance. There are certain things that uh, link back to a previous history. Uh, using uh, uh, the, the, these more realistic figures uh, to tell uh, instances of the, of the independence dates back at least to the 50s. This was done in, in 2012 in the context of uh, uh, when the, the, the status of the city of Jogjakarta was being contested, that it's now a special region, it's a sultanate within the Indonesian Republic, but at this time it was like that special status was being contested. So there was also like a political uh, impetus behind this performance that they wanted to show through this history that actually uh, it was important that that status be maintained. So, uh, you know, there are all sorts of interesting things about this performance. The music itself uh, is uh, 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 quite, uh, you know, it's like a garapan, it's like, even though it's gamelan, it's something that is uh, like a especially crafted for this performance. It's a lot faster, a lot more dynamic. That's, what you, that's something you'd expect for an opening scene. Uh, also, this was composed by Anon Suneko, uh, the son of uh, Pat Rusto, and uh, who is also somebody who's been quite involved in a number of, uh, of contemporary uh, Wayan performances. So anyways, there are all sorts of things that we can say about the music, about the form, about the content, about the language being, being used here. So, so, so one thing is that uh, you know, we kept all these notes, so you can see here on the side, all these notes that we kept about who are all the, uh, probably in this particular case, 
There are all sorts of uh, important uh, historical figures that are mentioned here that you might or might not be familiar with. Another thing that we decided to do for this particular archive is that we kept the honorifics in the original language. So as you know, in uh, Javanese and Indonesian, you can decide from a number of honorifics in the way that you address someone. So kind of like, you know, Bung Karno, like that. It's something that, uh, uh, but I mean, you have all sorts of different ways in which, uh, depending on the relative status between people, you would address each other. And uh, we decided that if we were to just, uh, in the English version, flatten that into just like, you know, you or like just the name of the person, we would lose a little a bit of the playfulness of those modes of address. Because they can also be used for uh, indicating uh, uh, changes in a story. So sometimes, you know, when, a, when, when there's a change in a story, like, you know, perhaps uh, for uh, the purpose of insulting somebody, you can use like a different kind of honorific, or for the case of humor, for example, uh, you, you could do uh, some like uh, 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 things that you would not expect in a traditional setting. Like, uh, the, the, for example, like, you know, like one character addressing another one as like mass, which means like older brother. But one like slang in Indonesian now is like you would say like mas bro, like bro is kind of like a, you know, bro, like a brother. So like this combination like mas bro is like something that, you know, it's a bit harder to explain in English, but we decided to keep all of these things in the original language. So, so you know, you can also hide the subtitles if you're not interested in that kind of information, and you can just watch uh, full screen. Uh, this particular performance is in Indonesian mostly. Many of them are in Japanese and we have translations both into English and into Indonesian. So many people, uh, many uh, young Indonesians from Java, for example, don't speak uh, Javanese, or Indonesians from across uh, the archipelago who might be interested in this, but that the language can still be a, a, a barrier. So, so anyways, we have, everything is uh, bilingual in Indonesian and English. Okay, I'm just in point one, so I'm, I'm not going to show you more uh, uh, examples at the moment. Like later on, I, I do encourage you to go and look at the video. Uh, and uh, we have like 24 full-length uh, performances that have been translated, annotated, and, and explained. And uh, so this is kind of like my, my first point, is that this can be used for a, a digital documentation, for a detailed documentation that can be used for fun, but also for scholarly purposes. Now I'm going to go and talk about the second part. And this is about how we can use digital tools for analysis of performances. And uh, so, you know, going back to, to, to one thing, that uh, 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 Professor Gulam was saying that you know in, in Malaysia perhaps you know if Adalan performs once per per, day, per year you know that's that's already good enough that means they're still active and uh, you know people say all these things about Java like you know is the tradition declining is it not de declining it's a bit hard to know we don't really have the data or sometimes we thought we didn't have the data but for the past two years we've been partnering with uh, a, a, an organization to try to uh, locate and. Uh, 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 make a list of every single performance in Java, every single traditional performance of Wayankulik in Java. So I ask you to just think, take a guess, how many performances do you think are scheduled for today, the 20th of October 2017? So I'm talking about like uh, traditional, like all night performances. Uh, so like, you know, uh, it's uh, so we call it like the like Luna Tasa, it's like, a, all, it's really like until, only until like 3.30, 4 a.m. So not really all night, it starts about nine. And it's a classical performance, so not talking about traditional thing, uh, contemporary things like this. So take a guess, like, you know, I mean, you don't need to say it out loud, but just think about how many performances do you think there are today? Actually, do, please say it out loud so I can. So what do you think? 20 to Well, actually, yes, very good. So there are, there are 20 performances today, but that, that was still like something that we, uh, like, you know, it's, uh, I still find that number surprising, that on a, on a given day, uh, usually we have about 20 performances across Java. So we have, uh, so, so I, I'm going to show you this. This is a graph that shows you over the past two years the number of performances per day. So you can see in some days, you know, it goes all the way up to like 40. Of course, there are some moments where there are only like zero performances. So this tends to also coincide with, uh, like, you know, doing the uh, uh, CM, like uh, the, the, the um, uh, <coughs> fasting month, the, the, the Ramadan, there are like, usually no performances. But you can see that you know this is there's a slightly I mean if we do an analysis of this there's a slightly upward trend it's not very noticeable but you know th there have been around six thousand all night classical wine performances in a two year period across Java and this is only the most traditional ones and this is without taking into account museum performances or uh, this is only you know traditionally uh, organized traditionally sponsored performances I, I love to, to to show data like this when I go to uh, 
uh, conferences in, uh, for example, I, I was uh, recently at a conference in Canada about the digital humanities. And uh, so, uh, you know, when I speak about why young people always think it's a very niche thing that I'm speaking about. And in some ways it is, but then I was telling them, well, yes, but, you know, as it was at that point, it was like 9 a.m. In, in Canada, so it was like 9 or like 10 a.m. in Canada, so that meant 10 p.m. In, in Java. So that meant at that, that at, at that point, it was a slow day in Java, there were only four performances going on, but each of these can be seen by like a few hundred performance uh, people. So there were like, you know, a few thousand people watching Guayang. And I, I you know, I'd like to, take the, to tell the audience, you know, but there are more people uh, watching Guayang now than there have ever been in the history of this conference that we're speaking now. So, so like, what, what is niche and what is representative is also, you know, tends to do with what we understand as, as theater. So, like, you know, if we were, uh, in many ways, this is one of the most, uh, it's still, even if it's disappearing, it's like an influential theater performance. And I think that this digital analysis gives us some sense of what those things can be. Okay, another question. So. Uh, another thing that you know, like that, people have been debating for a very long time, is the influence of characters that are the, the ones that are coming from the traditional, uh, like Sanskrit versions of the uh, of the uh, of the Mahabharata versus the things that you encounter in in Java. So uh, we know that certain characters, of course, the clowns are of Javanese invention. We know there are certain other characters, like you know, some of the sons of of Bhima, Ontoseno, uh, Ontorejo, uh, that are are not really found in the in the Sanskrit version. But sometimes, you know, we, it's hard to get a sense of how many characters are really part of each version. And this is a question that I like to ask, and I've asked also these to professional Dalang, to people that are incredibly knowledgeable about the traditions in Indonesia. So, and I ask to you now, how, what percentage of the characters, uh, so we took the most common stories, so like a, a combination of, uh, uh, you know, like Charangan, so like usually this uh, ranting, so like the branch, it's like the same concept, like you know, Charangan stories and like, you know, uh, Parwa, or like, you know, the, 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 you know, uh, I guess pokok would be like in, in your uh, in your terminology. So like we took like a, a, a sample of like the most common performances and counted the number of characters. So what percentage of these characters do you think come from the Indian version? So again, you don't necessarily need to to speak out, but like you know, when I've asked people in the past, especially people in Java that know a lot, they would usually guess between twenty to thirty percent. So I said about twenty to thirty percent are Japanese. 70% are of Indian, are Indian in origin. What we found by counting the characters is that actually it's almost 50 and 50. Almost half of the characters are of Javanese origin, which was surprising to me. It's surprising to a lot of practicing Dalang, and this is something that we uh, counted here, so you can see. It's like, you know, 53 versus 47, and I'm not going to go into all these details here, but I was working with a, 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 a colleague of mine who's a, a mathematician, uh, making these models of the characters. So one thing that you can see here in, in this graph is that the, 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 the um, so these blue dots are the Javanese characters, these uh, uh, green ones over here are the clowns, and all of the other ones are the Indian characters. So uh, even if you don't, I mean, I'm not going to go into the detail of what this means, but this is basically meaning uh, like how connected these characters are. So the more you go up, uh, either like on this uh, axis or on this axis, the more you go here, these are very well connected characters that have that are in a, in a number of of, uh, uh, of performances that are in a number of scenes. The ones over here tend to be in a lot less scenes. So what we see is that even though the characters are half and half, maybe the reason why we immediately think that there are more characters from India is because they tend to be more uh, more closely connected. They tend to be more uh, like you know still the story even though it's developed over hundreds of years, and all of these characters have been adopted. A lot of the Javanese characters have less friends, you know, or like you know, like uh, less connections, except for the clowns. You know, so maybe the, the you know, the lesson to learn, learn from this is that you, if you ever uh, move to another country, uh, make sure you're funny. So, so anyways, we, we thought this was surprising, and I think this is, a, and like even if you disagree with my, my results or like our way of analysis, I still think this is a surprising way of thinking about tradition. It's something that has surprised me, that has surprised my colleagues and people that are. Uh, a lot more knowledgeable than I am of uh, uh, of the tradition. So it's also you know, I agree with like you know, what you say. Also, like I'm also like a, a foreigner. I've only you know uh, I've only been studying this for about ten years, whereas people study this since they're like you know three years old. So so it's, it's also uh, uh, but you know I, I still think that sometimes thinking about this as data, thinking about these digital technologies helps you you know think about tradition in a slightly different way. I'm really running out of time, but I, I'm just going to show you two things very quickly.
Uh, one is this project that we're doing on. Uh, so I'm not going to, sh to show you the link. It's still work on development, but we're doing uh, something like, like like a learner's dictionary. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you have this when you're learning English or other uh, foreign languages, like a learner's dictionary. So it doesn't mean to be authoritative. It doesn't tell you, uh, you know, what things should be, but it's like a first dictionary and uh, and something that places things in context. So I'm doing something like this for the Wayanculid characters. There, are, there's there's a long tradition of making encyclopedias of Wayanculid characters. And they're usually like stories, and they tell you uh, different kinds of things that are fascinating, but sometimes to me they feel a bit random. So one thing that I'm doing in, in this project that I, I'm uh, the, uh, the, the, trying to finish soon is that for each character, uh, we'll have images. So in this case, uh, uh, the first set of images are only in the Jogjakarta style, like the Gagrak Jogjan. Uh, but we'll have, we're adding also like, images from the Surakarta visual tradition that is slightly different. Uh, and we have like certain things that we like to call like factoids. So this is like a, like the same kind of data for every single kind of character. So for each character, you can see what's the term of address that you that is most commonly used. Is this an Indian character? Is this like a human? Is it a god? Is it a clown? You also see like notes on the Sanskrit version, uh, alternative names. So in, in Java, like we have these like the dosonomo, uh, like the ten names. It's usually not ten, but it's just you know like alternative names of the same character. Description the stories in which they are, they are uh, found, and also we have a list of the most common characters that you would see this one with. So uh, uh, so, so all this kind of like information that if you grow up in the tradition, you would know. But if you're a newcomer, like it's a little bit like what I was asking to Doji uh, earlier, that if you're an, a newcomer to the tradition, there's a lot of this explicit knowledge, implicit knowledge, that it's hard for you to gain. As a foreigner, but even as, as, as a modern, as, as a young Javanese, like a lot of my friends uh, uh, now in, in Georgia, they wouldn't know uh, many things about the characters. Uh, like uh, an old puppeteer that passed away um, two weeks ago uh, was was talking to me how uh, in the like in the 60s and 70s, if you were to use a solo style puppet in Georgia, people would like uh, be angry at you and they would like you know uh, like be like it would be like offensive. But now you can use like a solo style puppet, and people might not even notice, or like you know, or maybe like things that have, have changed. But anyway, so in, in any case, this is also like a. a I mean, I, I'm not showing you the, the full length of the things that we have, but it's also like to teach you to look at the puppets. So, so what things matter, what things tell you, like the the, the regional variations, but also how, how to interact differently with this. Uh, this is another project, which is like a, a portal for the biomechanics of Japanese dance. This is a collaboration with uh, uh, people from the biomedical. Uh, uh, engineering department here at NUS. So what we did was we invited uh, professional dancers from Java to come here and perform certain uh, certain motions. Uh, and the emphasis here is not on trying to make the tradition, uh, to fix the tradition. So traditions are evolving, traditions are constantly changing. But there are certain, uh, again, think of it as, as a learner's dictionary. And there are certain things that if you want to look at Japanese dance, are important and some that are some that are not. For example, uh, one thing that all, always my, my students when I take them to Java uh, would say, oh, you know, I didn't like that dance. It was not very good because the, the, the performers were not synchronized. And I try to explain how like synchronization is not a cultural value. And especially for certain kinds of dance that are like very refined, actually the more refined, you're supposed to do it slightly after the music or slightly in a, in a, in a different way. So, so these kinds of things. Uh, and also, you know, one of the things that is perhaps the, the most important for a, for Japanese dance, for classical Japanese dance, or for adaptation, is this idea of character types. So even if you don't know the story, one of one of the of the, of the basic and like components of the language of Japanese dance is that you have like different kinds of characters. Like you know, broadly you have like three categories. You have like you know, the, the female characters. You have like the the, the gaga or like you know vigorous characters, and then you have the uh, halus or like refined characters that are somewhere in the middle. They're, they're kind of like somewhere between the the female character and the gaga character, and uh, there are like many different things that are like for the, like you know you would see from the makeup if it's a particular dance that has dialogue, uh, uh, like also the way in which they speak would be different. Like you know, the, 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 there tends to be like more movement, the more vigorous the character, more variations in tone, but also the kinds of like angles in the body. So like a, a very big character would have like a like bigger uh, variation. Like for a female character, a female character would never kind of like expose the armpits. Would be kind of like always, like, you know, closer to the body, whereas uh, uh, you know, like a very gaga character, you know, would do like you know, uh, things like this, like you know, like a uh, monkey characters or like you know, uh, 
uh, demon characters and so forth, and the Halus characters will be somewhere in between. So when we do in this uh, website that is actually fully functional, but I, I cannot, uh, so, so it's like this uh, website here, so you can go and look at the video. So as you look at this video, you also get to see a graph that, uh, where you can isolate uh, uh, each of the body parts. So, so we've done this for, for some of the major character types, and then you can, you can kind of like, you know, go back and see. This kind of like isolates each of the, of the you know, the different frames of the body. And then you can like put your mouse here and you be like, oh, like this is very interesting how this is like such a smooth curve. Or like, you know, I want to know what's the, this is the point where they're like at the most uh, flexed, at the most extended. And one advantage of motion capture is that it helps you think of things in a more abstract way. That if you only have a video, you see like a specific dancer or you see like, a, you see like the makeup, you see the, 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 the uh, you know, like the, the, the uh, how do you call it? The, 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 the things that they use, the uh, um, uh, uh, paraphernalia of the performance. In this case, you can isolate different things, and we can also do certain comparisons uh, that are, might be surprising. I mean, I, can, like, you know, the, I won't get into a, a lot of detail of that, but you can like, compare across these things. And you know, things that are surprising for me, at least, you know, like you know, what like of the joints. The, 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 there's all these things about like how the joints are different across the, the character types. Well, we actually found that the only joint that is like, like really like totally different in the way it's used is uh, this particular joint here, and uh, also the hip, uh, but especially like the, the right hip more than the left. And uh, I mean, like, I will have to go into a lot more detail uh, of the character types to tell you why I think that's surprising. But anyways, uh, the point here, whether you think this is a, a useful uh, uh, way to, 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 to spend your time or not, I, I want to suggest that this is one way of, of thinking differently about dance, about tradition. And especially, my interest is very specific. I don't want to, uh, for this particular case, I don't want to uh, fix the tradition once and for all. I want to introduce students to a different way of thinking. It's like a, a training of perception. This is something that also I've learned uh, from uh, uh, Jan Rasek and from a lot of other people, how also learning to appreciate uh, a particular kind of music, a particular kind of dance and theater is knowing what things are valued in that context, what things make sense in that context, and not use like your own predefined version. So for example, like often, you know, like uh, foreign visitors would come to Indonesia and they, they would only, you know, before it was called Indonesia, they, they, they would like be obsessed with Borobudur, for example, because it's something that they could, we can recognize. You know, you have these old, uh, um, you know, ruins in Europe, so therefore like there's these ruins, so that's, that, that's seen as art. Whereas, you know, textiles, which are incredibly important in Indonesia, are not considered particularly, or were traditionally, for a long time, not considered worthy of scholarly attention. So my interest here is just to know how can we train people, like how can we introduce students, use technology for people who don't have the benefit of, uh, you know, of 14 generations to, to develop uh, knowledge of a lifetime in training. If you only have like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a few sessions, introductions, but also like knowing what to look at, not learning to become a performer, but knowing what to look for. That, that's just uh, what I wanted to say uh, about this. And of course, I want to uh, do another project, which is about contemporary dance in Indonesia. So the same way we have an archive of uh, Wayang Contemporary, we want to have like a uh, contemporary dance. And I'm uh, hoping that, you know, Baheli, who's here, will become, will be like rotating to this project at some point. We're still trying to think what it might be, but doing something similar about like this. All the, the people that we're talking about in the morning session, that their, 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 their work that also reinterprets tradition in dance, thinking what that might be. Uh, this is another project that we did at the, at the, the, the uh, uh, Art Science Museum uh, here in Singapore. So we built a Wayang screen and we added like a bunch of sensors. Uh, so uh, the idea is that this would also, like you would arrive and it would show you videos of Wayang, but it has like a variety of motion sensors, similar to the ones that your phones have. And the idea is that instead of using a mouse or like a computer screen, a, a normal interface to navigate to these videos, you would use an interface that has some connection uh, some cultural connection to the, the, the videos that we're watching. So basically you would arrive and it, like, you would sit down and then it would tell you like this, like you know what the cayon is, how to use it, and how the, the cayon, for example, is often used to open the performance, like you would rotate it to one side, uh, put it on the get the bug uh, on, the, on, the, on the right, and that would indicate that the first, uh, like a scene is about to begin. And this usually indicates a, a, a change in the scenes. Uh, it's like a, like a curtain call, uh, if you like. So we decided to use that as a way to progress through the videos. So you would arrive, you would, you would move it, it would detect like you know, if you're roughly doing it the, the, the correct way, and that helps you uh, also watch these videos in this museum. It's more like a, like a thought 
experiment than, than something that really works, but, uh, but still, like, I, I offer it here as an example. As conclusion, I just want to say that uh, tradition in contemporary Indonesia and elsewhere is complex and should be studied in a nuanced way. So that's just like echoing what we've been hearing so far, that you know, these categories, histories, um, intercultural exchanges are things that if we only think of tradition, in some ways we're sweeping under the rug all these uh, fascinating discussions about how definitions change, how things are contested, how they're used for different political uh, objectives. And uh, in one way we want to avoid that, we want to really explore this in a very detailed way. And my belief as, a, as an optimist and as a, as, a, as a technological optimist is that tradition uh, is still uh, strong and that digital tools can offer one way of helping us study tradition. It's not the only way, but I, I think it, you know, it doesn't hurt. So thank you very much.